Good day, everyone. It is rainy, but we have sunshine in our hearts today. But this is a historical moment for us. And I want to tell you about the history of the Buncombe County Remembrance Project. The Buncombe County Community Remembrance Project started in September 2018 when community representatives began to meet to discuss information shared about the Equal Justice Initiative and the work of Brian Stevenson in an article that was published by the Mountain Express in late August of 2018. An initial meeting was hosted by the University of North Carolina, Asheville, where members of the Interfaith Initiative for Justice, Social Justice and the First Congregational United Church of Christ shared information about their recent trip to the Legacy Museum from enslavement to mass incarceration and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. The board members from the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Association of Asheville and Buckham County were having the similar discussions pertaining to the EJI's Remembrance Project. Discussions led the two groups forming a coalition to complete the Buncombe Community Remembrance Project. The initial decision was made that the coalition should have representatives from the city of Asheville, Buncombe County, local faith-based organizations, the University of North Carolina, Asheville, other interested community-based organizations, and that the effort should be led by a steering committee. The Martin Luther King Association of Asheville and Buncombe County became the lead organization in early 2019 to convene the group in an official capacity with Dr. Joseph Fox, vice president of our association, chairing the project. Individuals that attended the first organization meeting in 2018 were invited to a planning meeting to determine other community representatives, leaders, and organizations that should be invited to participate as a steering committee member. Invitations to join the Buckham Community Remembers Project Steering Committee were extended to individuals and organizations that had similar missions of acknowledging the personal and community trauma caused by racial violence. The Buckham Community Remembrance Project Steering Committee reviewed the EJI guidelines for the Soil Collection Project, Racial Justice Essay Contest, and the Historical Marker Project. The following work groups were established based on the guidelines. Communication PR Workshop co-chair Dr. Orlean Simmons and Ron Katz. Community Engagement Workshop co-chairs Reverend Demita Wilder and Rebecca Brother. Museum Tool Workshop Chair Yolanda Adams. Lynching Research Work Group, Chair Samantha Cole. Logistical Historical Marker Site Location Work Group, Chair Carmen Rebos Kennedy. Essay Competition Workshop, Chair Eric Grant. Education Outreach Workshop Co Chairs Ann Manning, Jacqueline Hallam, and Dr. Darren Waters. Compliance Workshop Co Chairs. Dr. Joseph Fox and Kimberly Archie. The following goals were established by the steering committee. More accurately reflect 
history of racial and economic injustice and equalities. Foster healing from the silent trauma surrounding racial violence, mass incarceration, violence in communities, state-sanctioned violence, police brutality. Foster local conversations and reflecting concerned community healing. Reconciliation events and transforming narratives. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. At this time, we're going to have greetings from uh, several of the staff members from the Equal Justice Initiative that are with us today. And I must say that it has been a pleasure working uh, with the three uh, young ladies around this project for the last two and a half years. And I'll let them introduce themselves. Thank you so much, Dr. Fox. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kiana. I'm a Justice Fellow at the Equal Justice Initiative, and I, along with my colleagues, Sian and Kayla, are really um, pleased to be here with you all today to join you in dedicating these three very important and permanent educational tools in the community. Um, the Equal Justice Initiative is a human rights organization dedicated to ending mass incarceration and challenging racial and economic injustice in our society. We were originally founded in 1989 when our executive director, attorney Brian Stevenson, came to Montgomery, Alabama, where we're based to defend people on Alabama's death row. We're an anti-death penalty organization. We believe that capital punishment should not exist, especially given the racially discriminatory ways in which it has been administered, um, both historically and today. Um, we also believe that everybody is more than the worst thing that they've ever done. And so we continue that work as an anti-death penalty organization, but we've also expanded our work to include challenging the excessive punishment of children, um, also challenging the inhumane and unconstitutional prison conditions throughout the state of Alabama, um, and providing reentry services for our clients so that they can have a meaningful life after incarceration. So after about 20 years of doing this work, we realized that in order to effectively address the racial and economic injustices we're seeing um, with our clients and within the context of the criminal legal system, that we were actually gonna have to take a step back and do a deeper dive into our nation's history of racial injustice because, because we believe the challenges that we're seeing in the criminal legal system are deeply rooted in this history. And so in 2008, we started a public history initiative um, we began doing a lot of research into our nation's history, starting with Montgomery and um, the role that Montgomery played in the domestic slave trade, and then expanding that to um, a national scale. Um, and then in 2018, we actually um, established two very important cultural sites, including the Legacy Museum and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which um, Dr. Simmons just mentioned. Um, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice stands in memory of the over 4,400 victims, black victims of racial terror lynching um, between the end of Reconstruction in 1877 and 1950. And the Legacy Museum traces the history of enslavement all the way to present day mass incarceration. So I'm gonna hand it over to Kayla to talk a little bit more about this history. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kayla Vincent and I'm a staff attorney at the Equal Justice Initiative. And I just want to talk a little bit more about what my colleague Kiana was just saying about the fact that EJI didn't come to this work as public historians, but rather as legal advocates who had already spent two decades trying to help courts and other actors in the criminal justice system understand how the outcomes that our clients were facing were really about um, that race and wealth were really impacting those outcomes. And it just became clear to us that part of the problem was that as a nation, people were, didn't know this history and people were too comfortable with the really intolerable and inhumane things that our clients face on a daily basis. And so that is what pushed us to want to um, invite people to join us on this journey of understanding the history of racial injustice in this country of understanding that at EJI, we believe that slavery never ended, it simply evolved. And that one of the systems that it evolved into was the era of racial terror lynching, which is a time period where this myth of black dangerousness 
Um, this idea that a racial democracy was impossible in the United States, the foundational commitment to white supremacy and racial hierarchy continued when it didn't have to. And that continuance led to, between 1865 and 1877, the, the lynchings of at least 2,000 black people um, in an era where the, the deaths of black people were so poorly documented, there are very likely many more who we do not know. And then ushered in an era of racial terror lynching where at least 4,500 black people lost their lives, including Mr. Humphreys, Mr. Rankin, and Mr. Brackett. And we know that this myth of black dangerousness was invoked in order to justify brutal acts of white domination. It was never about dangerousness. It was about white supremacy. And our executive director often talks about the death penalty as a stepchild of lynching because of the relationships between the two, because of the fact that some of the states with the highest rates of lynching during the lynching era today have the highest rates of death penalty sentences. And so when we think about what it means to fully memorialize these three men today and to honor um, the conditions of life that they endured, that means we have to also have a commitment to ending the era of mass incarceration. Because today in the state of North Carolina, it is still possible for a person to be sentenced to death. It is possible for a child as young as six to enter the criminal justice system. And as a nation, we have our um, prison population has, blossom, has um, grown from 1972, it was about 200,000 people. Today, it is 2.3 million. If you include people who are on probation and parole, that number exceeds 7 million. This is not about public safety. It is about a myth of black dangerousness that turned into a law and order politics that today is um, preventing us from being safer. So for people who wonder and would like to believe that had they been alive during the era of racial terror lynching, that they would have been insisting that it end, that they would have been with Ida B. Wells Barnett, they would have been with the NAACP and insisting that this era end, you don't have to wonder what you would have done if you lived during an era of a massive racial injustice, because you currently live in an era of massive racial injustice. So the answer to that question is what are you doing today? And we believe that this um, project that Sian is gonna talk about in a moment is a really important step to really beginning that process of repair in our country. So we're very grateful to you all for joining us today, for joining a national conversation and insisting that Asheville and Buncombe County can be a different place. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. I'm Sian Blackwell, and I'm a Justice Fellow at the Equal Justice Initiative. I just thank my colleague, Kayla, for really giving you all that invitation to join this work and to really come and join us in this work of fighting, fighting racial injustice in this era. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Community Remembrance Project, which you are here today for in Buncombe County and how this work has grown nationally from the Equal Justice Initiative. So it's one of our core beliefs that you have to be proximate to this work you have to be proximate to the issues of racial injustice and inequality in order to re make real change. And we believe that when we were doing this research and we were documenting over the 6,500 victims of racial terror lynching, we realized that this, this history was local. It was happening in individual communities and people weren't talking about it. They were distancing themselves from it. And we realized that this is something that is crucial for communities individually to recognize. Just right here in Buncombe County, you have three documented victims and we really appreciate the work that Dr. Fox and Dr. Simmons and everyone on the Buncombe Community Members Project has done this, thus far to recognize these victims. They have, we have three projects, a soil collection project, the racial justice essay contest, and the historical marker ceremonies. And this community has already completed the soil collection project, as you see here, the three jars that were collected back in May. And we had a record number of students participate in the racial justice essay contest. And now for all of you being here today, it's so wonderful to see so many faces here to recognize these men. And I hope you go on the journey with us to unveil these markers. But I ask of you all to think about where does it, as Kayla mentioned, where do you go next? If you have a neighbor, a family member, or a friend who's not here, mention these men's names by name to them. Ask them what, do they know these stories? Bring them to these markers, make sure that they engage because our community remembrance work is a long-term commitment. Even though this community has already finished the three projects, it doesn't end here. This work is never finished because we are currently in this era of racial injustice. We are in the era of mass incarceration. 
And so I just ask you all to really stay engaged, stay involved, and think about your community when we're doing this work. And come and visit us in Montgomery as well at the Legacy Museum for mass, from Enslavement to Mass Incarceration and at the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. And I really just want to say thank you again for being here. And I hope that you really um, reflect on this history as we say these men's names today and we go to these markers. So um, thank you all again for being here. <laughs> And again, we want to thank you three for the hard work and all of the work that you've done with us. Our work could not have been uh, completed without the support of the city and the county. I know that I saw uh, our city manager, Deborah Campbell. There she is. So thank you for being here. Do we have any other local officials other than the ones that are on the stage with us? Councilwoman Kimbrum, thank you for being here. And at this time, we're going to have greetings from our own mayor, Esther Manheimer, uh, from the city of Asheville, followed by welcome from uh, the chairman, Brownie Newman, of our county commissioners. Good morning. Um, I just have to say, uh, before I make my remarks, that this is one of those many moments that I'm proud of my community. You all showed up today and supporting this effort. I'd like to thank Dr. Fox and the Buncombe County Remembrance Project for inviting me to speak today. It is truly an honor to be here. The city of Asheville supports the ongoing efforts of the Buncombe County Remembrance Project to address discriminatory policies and laws and actions that brought violence and trauma to the black community, not only in our community, but across the country. These historical markers allow us to acknowledge these racially motivated murders and honor three men specifically. Bob Brackett, Hezekiah Rankin, and John Humphreys, who's victim, who were victims of lynching here in Buncombe County. The city of Asheville is committed to advancing racial, racial equity by identifying and eliminating root causes of racial disparities and promoting equitable policies, laws, and actions within the city's organization. Last year, the city of Asheville City Council passed a resolution supporting community reparations for Black Asheville. In June, we completed the first step of that process with an information and truth-telling speaker series. Now, we're working with the community members to form the Community Reparations Commission. The commission will be empowered to make recommendations to the city council as well as the greater community toward repairing the damage caused by public and private systemic racism. These recommendations are anticipated to include housing opportunities, economic development, public health, education, public safety, and justice for the black community. While this project is an important step toward community healing, it also serves as a reminder of the hard work still ahead of us. I'm proud of what we've already accomplished, and I know our city and community will continue to take deliberate steps towards racial equity and justice. Once again, I'd like to thank the Buncombe County Community Remembrance Project for inviting me here today and all of you as well. And I'll turn it over to Brownie Newman, the Buncombe County Chairman. Hi, good morning and welcome. My name is Brownie Newman and I serve as chair of the Buncombe County Commission and it's an honor to be with you all this morning. I did see a few of our other county commissioners who are with us this morning and county officials and I'd like to acknowledge uh, them. I'm, I apologize if I miss anyone, but I saw uh, Commissioner Terry Wells, uh, our Vice Chair, Commissioner Al Whitesides, 
Amanda Edwards, and Jasmine Beach Ferrara. We also have some other county representatives with us, our county manager, Avril Pender, our assistant county manager, D.K. Wesley, Lillian Grobitz from our uh, community engagement office, and if I've missed others, I, I apologize. Thank you all for your work with the county and the community. We are here this morning to acknowledge three men, John Humphreys, Hezekiah Rankin, and Bob Brackett, who lived in our community and were the victims of lynchings. Lynching was used not only to carry out mob violence against individuals, it was a form of organized terrorism to maintain the white power structure in our society. The message from the white mob to the black community was clear. We have the power. Stay in your place or this is what can happen to you. I wanna thank all the members of our community who have supported the Buncombe County Remembrance Project. This is important work and is leading to a better and more full understanding of our history. The history of Buncombe County includes the stories of many people who changed our community for the better and we can be proud of. But it also includes the stories that can reveal the cruel, violent, and discriminatory nature of people and communities as a whole. We need to hear all of these stories because they are part of how we became the community that we are today. Understanding our past is necessary for our work today to end mass incarceration, to create a more fair justice system, and to repair the damage done to minority neighborhoods families, and businesses through housing discrimination and urban renewal. Thank you all again for being with us this morning and for participating in the important work going ahead. Thank you. We would like to thank both of you. We also want to recognize Sheriff Quentin Miller, who's with us. You wave. And we are also, we have two um, individuals from Buncombe County Sheriff uh, Department working with us today uh, with security. I also want to introduce a couple other special recognitions uh, before we move on. This work uh, would not have gotten done without the support of Dr. Orling Simmons, uh, Mr. Ron Katz, who does our e-newsletter. So if you're not getting our monthly e-newsletter, Ron is right back here. He will be. He has a pad, and he will be happy to sign you up. Uh, we also want to recognize Rebecca Brothers, uh, who has just become my left and right hand person. I don't know what I would have done without her. Um, so I know she's shy, but I have to give you a shout out. Uh, Samantha Cole was our chair of our research group uh, and did a wonderful job. And there are other folks uh, that you've already heard mentioned as chairs and co-chairs of the work groups, so I'm not going to mention them uh, at this time. But also the city employee, uh, employers, employees, excuse me, city employees, Ken Putman and Chad Brandy, who worked with us around logistics, getting the markers up. They were out yesterday uh, installing the markers, so we are really thankful to them. And Aisha Adams Media Group, uh, who helped promote uh, the event. Also, want to recognize our steering committee. So, if you are part of the steering committee, would you just wave your hand? I, I know that there were days that they um, didn't know what to quite think of me I, when we. Uh, when they asked me to kind of chair the committee, I said, okay, I will give you all 18 months, and within 18 months, this is what we're going to do. And somebody reminded me this morning that we are at 18 months. <laughs> uh, we've also heard about the, the various work groups. So at this time, I want to recognize uh, Mr. Eric Grant, uh, who worked with our essay contest with uh, in, including Carrie Hampton, 
and Laura Parks, uh, and they did outstanding work working with our high school students. So I'm going to let Eric tell you more about that. Uh, good morning. What an honor it is to be a part of this historic event, and thank you all for coming out in the rain uh, to be a part of this as well. First of all, I'd like to thank the Equal Justice Initiative, Dr. Fox, uh, the Martin Luther King Jr. Association, Asheville City Schools, and Buncombe County Schools for providing this authentic opportunity for students to engage in such meaningful work. As you've already heard, we had a record number of student participants uh, to write in the essay contest. They represented eight different public high schools in Asheville and Buncombe County. They were asked to examine and write essays addressing the following prompt. Discuss a historical event in the context of the legacy of racial injustice today. Explain the chosen topic and reflect on how it is relevant today and what it teaches us about the solutions needed for a future without racial injustice. Before announcing the student winners, I want to acknowledge the essay contest committee without whom this would have been impossible. Uh, if you are here today, as your names are called, just raise your hand uh, so you can be acknowledged. I'd like to start first with uh, the two people that Dr. Fox acknowledged a moment ago. Uh, Carrie Hampton from North Buncombe Middle School. Uh, several years ago when, um, when Brian Stevenson came here, uh, Carrie chased down uh, the mayor and said, I want to bring those markers to Asheville after the event. And so uh, she was a big part of getting them here. So uh, it's a big day, I know, for her. Um, and then Laura Parks from Asheville City Schools, who was relatively new to her job at the city schools. And I called her and said, hey, do you want to be a part of this? And she jumped right on board and really uh, helped get Asheville City in, in, in the process as well. So thank you both for your, your shared leadership in this endeav endeavor. Um, again, if you're an educator uh, and, and are here today, uh, raise your hand as I acknowledge. The Buncombe County teachers, Emily Gill, Dean Presson, David Kaler, Dan Clare, Rachel McKinley, Shelby Lewis, John Shoup, Laura Welsh, Susie Pruitt, Ben Graham, Joy Keene, Frank Tayez, Aaron Meadows, Taylor Red, and Arami Bollock. And our Asheville City School teachers include Ariel Robinson, Megan Turk, Amanda Galvin, Neil Clement, Will Smith, Kim Adams, and Amy Wisner. Please acknowledge us, thank you. And I think it's important in um, these relatively charged political times to acknowledge those teachers who uh, were willing to engage their students in this uh, essay contest. So uh, that's why I wanted to make sure all those teachers who were part of that committee uh, were acknowledged today. Uh, and now for the student heroes of this work. While I will read aloud the names of the top six place winners, I would like to thank and acknowledge all of the students who showed the bravery and strength to write about such an important topic. Thank you for that. If you are a student who wrote an essay, please uh, raise your hand and we can acknowledge you. Uh, it's a little hard to see with the umbrellas. Each of these top six place winners was awarded a cash prize generously provided by the Equal Justice Initiative and the Martin Luther King Jr. Association of Asheville and Buncombe County, as were many of our honorable mentions. As I read these names, you will note several ties for the top six spots. According to the Equal Justice Initiative, the overall quality of the essays was so exceptional that they had a very difficult time selecting the top six. Uh, so I'll go ahead and read the names of those students. Tied for sixth place, Maya Resnick and Emily Leahy from Asheville High School. Fifth place, Megan Cairns from A.C. Reynolds High School. Tied for fourth place, Rainier Hardy from Martin Nesbitt Discovery Academy and Eleanor Hewitt Corzine from Silsa. And I've asked our top uh, third, our top three place winners to uh, step forward and um, be acknowledged on the stage. 
So in third place from AC Reynolds High School, Ansley Whitaker. <laughs> Tied for second place, uh, Colette Russ from Asheville High School and Montur Montana Guru uh, from Silsa. That's Montana Gura, uh, I want to pronounce that correctly. And our overall winner uh, from North Buncombe High School, uh, Miss Sarah Buchanan. And I'll ask Sarah's teacher, Emily Gill, to join on stage as well, as Emily uh, will, was the, uh, the, the teacher who uh, supported uh, Sarah in writing that. All, uh, there we go. All five of these young ladies have offered to participate in today's events, and you'll hear from them later. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being here today, and thank you to all the students and all the adults who supported this competition. So we are almost at the end of our program, so just a couple uh, additional announcements. Again, we have materials up here, uh, 2022 calendars, et cetera. Uh, that you can pick up at the end of the program. Again, we want to thank you for being with us. We hope that you will go with us to the markers. There will be just a short program there where we will have an opening prayer, unveiling of the markers, uh, reading of one of the essays at each of the markers, uh, and then the reading of the lynching narratives, closing comments by Orlene Simmons, and closing prayer. So we will proceed from here to the closest marker, which is up by the restrooms. We'll do the short program there, immediately go to the second marker, two blocks down, Triangle Park for a short program. We will then give everyone 15 to 20 minutes uh, that would like to travel to the third location uh, at the intersection of Craven Street and Emma Road for that short program. Uh, we are now going to be, uh, we'll have a uh, musical selection by the Weston Brothers, followed by the closing prayer by Reverend Brent LaPrince Edwards. Thank you. I guess I'm okay. One more thing, I was just reminded by my boss <laughs> that I missed a, a thing on my program. I have my glasses off. I was fogging up. So we do want to recognize our funders uh, that really made this, this project um, a reality for us. Uh, the Community Foundation of Western New York Carolina has been an extremely strong partner. We hope to take a uh, one or two motor coaches to the museum in the spring. They have graciously donated additional funding for us where we think we will be able to pay for anyone in the community that wants to go on that trip. The Van Winkle Law Firm uh, has been a strong partner uh, and also financially but also opened up their parking today uh, as well as the Dogwood Health Trust Fund. So thank you. Can you just look at someone and say, we're better together? Can you look at someone else and say, we're better together? Those who don't study the past will repeat its errors. Those who do will learn, grow, and do better. Let us pray. As we leave now to dedicate the markers of these three historical, prolific young men, Hezekiah Rankin, John Humphreys, Bob Rackett. We dedicate these markers as sacred grounds. May they serve as an eternal reminder to all who see them that injustice to any is injustice to all. We are better together. Amen. Amen. 
It begins in elementary school. As children, we sit there, crisscrossed, and they tell us about the history of our nation. Our teachers say that the natives were the original people of our land, that they helped us lay the foundations of crops and survival for our new beginning. And in many ways, that's true. But what they don't say, at least not at first, is that we didn't give them that same respect. In fact, we stole their land and butchered their bison, if only to force away the very people whose lands we took with blood and cruelty. Since our arrival, there has been a crisis for Native Americans. We have misplaced them, and even to this very day, they remain in the gray space of recovery not yet fulfilled. The United States has an unfortunate and disgraceful history of genocide and mass racial relocation. As MLK once said, our nation was born in genocide when it embraced the doctrine that the original American, the Indian, was an inferior race. Even before there were large numbers of Africans on our shores, the scar of racial hatred had already disfigured colonial society. In the state of North Carolina, this history is extremely prevalent and yet somehow still under acknowledged. The Trail of Tears took place across numerous states in the South, relocating approximately 100,000 natives from their homeland. North Carolina was not only complacent, our legislator and government had a direct hand in affecting indigenous lives. We built roads and militia forts for the sole sake of Indian removal including the Great State Road of Franklin and Fort Butler to sell indigenous lands. This paints an ugly, disfigured portrait of how we treated those who came before us and how the past still manages to repeat itself in unassuming and unsuspecting ways. North Carolina has not only forgotten about the natives of the past, but the natives of the present as well. Native women are three times as likely to experience violence and twice as likely to be sexually violated than women of other races. In this state alone, 90 cases of missing indigenous women dating back to 1994 remain unsolved. Take the case of Faith Hedgepeth, a Lumbee sophomore at UNC Chapel Hill who was found with brutalizing head injuries in her own dorm after a night out. Take the case of Rhonda Jones, her corpse found upside down and in a state of decomposition within a trash can. Jones's mother only received inconclusive autopsy results after a year of pressuring investigators for them, by which the results were useless in finding the killer. These incidences being so local but so unheard of speaks volumes. I have never heard so much of a mention of these women, nor the many other women who have suffered at the hands of Native American invisibility. History has shown a pattern of tossing indigenous concerns and well-being aside, to be addressed later, to be left alone. No longer can we be idle with the rise of violence towards our Native sisters, and no longer can we be complacent in their absences. We have founded a culture that has led to these troubling and disturbing crime statistics, not only in our past actions and influences, but in our everyday lives as well. My aunt carries the native features of my grandfather, darkened skin and eyes, a signature indigenous nose and stature. From her younger years onward, she has been belittled, teased, called slurs by her own family members in a joking manner, given Indian-themed gag gifts and never quite encouraged to connect with her culture. She bleached her skin in the early 2000s before I was born. And although you can still see her heritage on her face, I wish I could have been around to see it in her skin. Because it is not just violent crimes that arise out of unfathomable depths. It is a history and mindset of constantly treating the first humans of this continent as lesser, it is constantly belittling, demonizing, and forcing misconceptions of savagery onto what we don't want to understand. But while these problems are large and intimidating, they are not quite insurmountable. North Carolina must acknowledge a more in-depth look at our local history of Native genocide from the past and present, along with the historical landmarks made to serve that very purpose. We must purge ourselves of indifference 
strive to spread awareness of our missing Native women, look into local cases and demand more investigation for victims who never received justice. We, we cannot, cannot undo, undo the past, the past so we can create a better present, a better future for Native Americans. At the very start of our nation, they helped us establish a new beginning. Now it is our turn to start a new beginning of prosperity for them. And that begins with acknowledgement. Let's say their name, let's say his name, John Humphrey. John Humphrey. I also would like to have one of the EJR fillers come and receive the covering that we hope you will carry to another community. Now we will have the reading of the narrative. In July of 1888, the daughter of Benjamin Parker, a white suburban planter, was reportedly assaulted in the woods as she returned to her home outside the city. For generations, white supremacy and racist hostility have levied unfair accusations and harmful assumptions of guilt in such crimes on black Americans. Late on the evening of July 14, 1888, police arrested John Humphrey, a black youth reportedly about 17 years of age, for the assault. Police officers took Mr. Humphreys to the Parker residence, where Mr. Parker's daughter reportedly identified him as the assailant. The following morning, a masked mob broke into the jail where Mr. Humphreys was being held, intimidated law enforcement into unlocking the cell doors, and forcibly removed Mr. Humphreys. The mob lynched John Humphreys by hanging him from a tree within a few hundred yards of the jail. Although court proceedings took place in the matter of the lynching, a jury found just one perpetrator identified only by the last name Tomlinson or Thomerson, to have been an accessory to the, to the lynching before the fact. No one was held truly accountable for the racial terror lynching of John Humphrey. I also, before we close, want to recognize any of the MLK board members that are here. You have to wave your hand, MLK board members. Thank you for your support. And now we'll have closing comments by Dr. Orlean Spinman, followed by a closing prayer uh, by Reverend Ed. to the skies on flowery beds of ease, while others fought to win the prize and sail the stormy seas. Sure, I must fight if we would rest. Increase our courage, Lord. We will bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by your word. As we leave now this sacred place in honor of Mr. Humphreys and others, may we arise to new service to make our world a better place, one heart at a time. In Jesus' name, amen. When a toxic PCB lace landfill was built in a mostly black, poor, and politically powerless town in Warren County, North Carolina, residents were furious. Health concerns relating to the dump were ignored, 
leading them to protest in an event regarded by many as the beginning of the environmental justice movement. In recent years, many other minority neighborhoods have had similar experiences due to their underrepresentation in state and federal government. It is clear that state governments specifically choose poor, non-white communities to dump toxic waste, dismissing detrimental health effects it could have. The state of North Carolina explicitly chose Boring County for the location of a hazardous waste landfill because of its poor and mostly African American population. In September 1982, over 6,000 truckloads of toxic PCB lace soil were shipped to Afton, a small town in Warren County. Afton was rural, poor, and nearly 60% black, making it a convenient destination for a toxic waste landfill. This is supported by the history of redlining, or discrimination in housing and lending by banks against communities of color. The Civil, the Civil Rights, Rights Act, Act of 1968 and its fair housing provisions outlawed yet failed to eliminate these practices. Black neighborhoods remain poor, making their property a cheap location for a landfill. Jolly Burwell, civil rights activist and resident of Afton, North Carolina, told the Washington Post that her community was a primary target for the landfill because, to quote, we were poor, we were black, and we were politically impotent. These discriminatory practices kept African American neighborhoods poor, vulnerable, and politically powerless. North Carolina chose to place a landfill in a cheap location where those it affected the most had the least ability to prevent it. Inexpensive property and lack of political representation allowed neighborhoods like Afton to be easily selected for toxic waste disposal, and potential health hazards were purposefully overlooked because they could disrupt the construction of the landfill. PCBs, or polychlorinated biphenyls, are known to cause birth defects, cancer, and other disorders in the organs if inhaled or absorbed through the skin. In order to build the landfill, the state refused to acknowledge these effects and other concerns over PCBs leaching into the water supply. The toxicity of PCBs was known information at the time, but was dismissed because it posed a legal threat. This infuriated the residents of Warren County. Six weeks of peaceful protest led to over 500 arrests, which authors Skelton and Miller from the NRDC call the first arrests in U.S. history over the siting of a landfill. North Carolina ignored and actively tried to silence worries of health repercussions that might act as a barrier to the placement of the dump. To summarize, the Warren County injustice occurred because the residents had no political power or representation to be able to stop it. Likewise, the absence of minority groups in state and federal government has resulted in inefficient or non-existent environmental justice initiatives. In 1992, President George W. Bush created an environmental justice working group, but later weakened it, claiming that it should advocate for all Americans rather than concentrating on racial minorities. Another federal office, the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, was tasked with addressing environmental injustice issues in 1994. However, according to the Center for Public Integrity, the EPA dismisses outright more than 9 in 10 environmental discrimination complaints. This, may be, this is partially due to the lack of diversity and passion for environmental justice among government officials and organizations. In 2008, Uniontown, Alabama became home to the Arrowhead Landfill, over a half billion gallons of toxic coal ash. 84% of Uniontown residents are black, while 49% live under the poverty line. Similar to Warren County, hazardous waste disproportionately affects people of color, and residents from both locations have experienced numerous health consequences. In 2012, Uniontown residents filed a civil rights complaint to the EPA, stating that the landfill adversely and disparately impacts African Americans in violation of federal anti-discrimination laws. After six years, in 2018, the EPA denied the complaint because of insufficient evidence. Consistent, Consistent with, with Warren County, County the, the residents of Uniontown experienced inequity in the placement of toxic waste and dismissal of racial discrimination and health concerns. The Uniontown case parallels Warren County. Both occurred in poor and majority African American communities who tried to defend against toxic landfills. Reports of environmental injustice in Uniontown were dismissed by the federal government, and residents from both Uniontown and Warren County have experienced health issues from the toxic waste, as well as contaminated drinking water. In order, in order to, to overcome, overcome this, this toxic, toxic legacy, 
state and federal officials for minority groups and with knowledge of and passion for environmental justice must be elected. By having representatives who feel strongly about environmental racism and including environmental justice advocates in decision making, the government will gain an increased awareness of these injustices and will be more willing to use methods of toxic waste disposal that are eco-friendly in addition to being people-friendly. The Biden administration, which was elected with record voter turnout, has promised to have every federal agency consider environmental justice in their actions. To elect more diverse and racially, and to, elect, to elect more diverse and, and environmentally and racially conscious people requires increased voter registration and turnout. If more people register to vote than ever before, a big difference can be made in the state and federal government. Elections can give more political power to minorities and people of color, allowing them to stand up against hazardous waste and other forms of discrimination. I believe that safe and clean water is a human right, and that by voting for diverse representatives who advocate for environmental justice, we can bring attention to current problems such as the Uniontown landfill that have yet to be addressed. With help from passionate officials and environmental justice activists, states can develop alternate methods of toxic waste disposal that don't harm communities and strengthen the movement that began in Warren County. And we prepare for the narrative of the fine if we would have a representative from each AI. Bob Gratchett was a traveling laborer passing through the Asheville, North Carolina area. On August 8, 1897, Kitty Henderson of Weaverville alleged she had been assaulted. Suspicion was immediately directed toward local black men and Kitty identified Mr. Gratchett. During this era, deep racial hostility burdened black people with presumptions of guilt often resulting in accusations that were unfounded, unreliable, and which resulted in mob actions without due process of law. Mr. Bratchett was apprehended by a posse on August 10th at the home of Reverend Sandy Ray in nearby Barnardsville. Despite a lack of evidence to indicate his involvement, Mr. Bratchett was taken to the Asheville jail. An angry white mob stormed the jail only to discover the sheriff had taken Mr. Bratchett on the train to Raleigh. The mob forcefully seized Mr. Bratchett from the train near Old Fort and brought him back to Weaverville, the scene of the alleged crime. He was lynched on the grounds of the Hemp Hill School. Lynching was a terrorist tactic meant to reinforce white supremacy. No one was ever held accountable for the murder of Bob Bratchett. ceremony for this particular location, but please continue with us to our final station. Thank you for joining us for this historical occasion as we continue to remember and lift up those named and unnamed sons and daughters of North Carolina and the nation whose last breath was from a particular station place of a lynching tree. Our next location, and we hope you will continue with us on this journey for today, is located uh, on Craven Street and Emmer Road. Let us pray. As we, Lord, dedicate this dedication in the name of Barb Ratchet, as well as many others, let us forever be reminded that we were all born not just to make a living, but we were all born to make a difference. And may we move forward now in the spirit of love, unity, and togetherness, making this world a better place, one heart at a time. In Jesus' name.
we want to thank those that have followed us uh, to all three locations. And of course, now that we're at the last location, the sun is trying to come out and the rain is stopping. But uh, we will carry on. This is our last site, so we're going to open uh, with a prayer. It was Alma, Irene, Basil, and Joseph who painted the words, If I can help somebody as I travel along, if I can do my duty with a word or song, if I can show someone that he or she is traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. Let us pray. We are so grateful today, oh great God, for coming together because we can feel the energy from each other and we're so much better together. And now as we come to dedicate this third site, we ask now your blessings and may this be a perpetual memorial to all who will see it that injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. Thank you for allowing us to be alive, to be a part of a living solution. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll have a third reading essay as we unveil the marker. United States citizens are fortunate to have the right to decide our nation's future. United States citizens are fortunate to have the right to decide our nation's future. In this country, felony convictions do not take away that citizenship, but they do take away that right. Felony disenfranchisement is the restriction or elimination of voting rights, Second Amendment rights, and other benefits of citizenship for convicted felons. Once, Once released, released from, from jail, jail ex-felons, a population disproportionately made up of POC, typically black Americans, lose enfranchisement indefinitely. In the United States, felony disenfranchisement violates civil rights by limiting felons' participation in our country's democratic processes, undemocratic and unethical, both because they are U.S. citizens and they count towards population totals that establish district and state representation. Felony, felony disenfranchisement originated in North America from English colonial common law practices called civil death which are retracting voting rights for glaring moral offenses. After the American Revolution, however, states began disenfranchising all felons. Post-Civil War, in response to the brief period of African-American prosperity known as the Reconstruction, many state governments turned to disenfranchisement to benefit their racist interests. Alabama was flagrant in suppressing the black vote, with the author of their disenfranchisement provision stating that, quote, the crime of wife beating alone would disqualify 60% of the Negroes, unquote. South Carolina began disenfranchising people who committed what they referred to as black crimes. They said those were thievery, adultery, arson, wife beating, housebreaking, and attempted rape, but not those convicted of murder or fighting. These racist implementations led to the unbalanced elimination of voting rights for black Americans. In North Carolina, the racist motives behind widespread felony disenfranchisement could not be more clear. Before the 1860s, North Carolina disenfranchised only those of what were termed as infamous crimes. After the Civil War and Reconstruction, an extensive movement organized by former rebels convicted black North Carolinians of infamous crimes with, quote, the express goal of preventing African Americans from being able to vote. Further, North Carolina added felony disenfranchisement to the state constitution in 1877 with the sole objective of, quote, neutering the gains of the radical reconstruction, particularly the advances of the 15th Amendment, which gave, which gave black men the right to vote. The Felony Disenfranchisement Committee chairman, John Henderson, was an enthusiastic Jim Crow supporter, once managing the lynchings of three black Americans. The fact that this committee's head was so unapologetically racist obligates North Carolina to take another look at the roots and ethics of such a practice. 
Detrimental repercussions from these centuries-old laws continue to contribute to the racially discriminatory incarceration and felony disenfranchisement policies that we see today. Black people have a five-fold chance of incarceration compared to their white peers, with significantly longer sentences. Black men are sentenced to 20% longer sentences than white men for the same crimes, and they are 64% more likely to be charged with a mandatory minimum sentence than their white counterparts when committing the same crime. Imprisonment funnels directly into disenfranchisement, with an average of 1 in 16 African Americans aged 18 or older stripped of their voting rights. This is 3.7 times greater than the rate of non-African American adults. Racial discrepancies in the U.S. prison and disenfranchisement systems have prompted much discussion on whether these policies and practices honor the foundations of this country. The constitutional debate surrounding felony disenfranchisement is passionate on both sides. While it is undoubtedly undemocratic, does it violate the U.S. Constitution? The 14th Amendment grants citizenship to every person born or naturalized in the U.S and states that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall deny to any person equal protection of the laws. Every citizen, regardless of any distinguishing factor, must be treated equally under the law, logically including the right to vote, something that does not occur under current policies. Many opponents to enfranchising ex-felons cite Section 2 of the 14th Amendment as their constitutional justification. Section 2 states that government cannot deny or abridge any person's voting rights except in the case of, quote, participation in rebellion or other crime, unquote. This is a compelling argument only if we disregard the rest of Section 2, as it continuously refers to the United States voting body as male citizens 21 years of age. The United States no longer restricts enfranchisement to white 21-year-old men nor do we adhere to the moral ideologies of the 1860s. Therefore, the U.S. should not continue to uphold this antiquated section of the 14th Amendment. Voting disqualification should be abolished, for it goes against strides this nation has made in regards to civil rights. The United States prides itself on civil rights advocacy, citizens' rights to political and social freedom and equality. However, the U.S. falls short considering millions of American citizens are forbidden to vote even though they are required to pay tax in, taxes while imprisoned. The cry for no taxation without representation rings true in 2021 as in 1773, and while felons are counted in population totals for their jails districts, resulting in more representation for the surrounding community, they have no say in who that representation is. The U.S. cannot claim to support civil rights if the very policies it has in place effectively destroy them. Nevertheless, the future of our democracy is not altogether bleak. There is hope, a right to vote amendment to the U.S. Constitution. An RTV amendment would protect the right to vote for everyone, focusing on four areas. One, ending loophole discrimination in the voting process in regards to voter suppression, misinformation, and severe partisan gerrymandering. Two, allowing ex-felons to vote immediately upon release. Three, allowing voters in D.C. to vote for federal representation. And four, allowing residents of Puerto Rico to vote for federal representation. The United States has much work to do to ensure equity in our nation. Millions of engaged, tax-paying, census-counting American citizens are outlawed from voting. Felony disenfranchisement contradicts everything our country claims to honor. Fair, free elections, political and social equality, strong morals and progressive ideologies. Stripping ex-felons of their right to vote is undemocratic, unethical, and un-American. We must work to establish a future where everyone is guaranteed equal protection under the law. the laying of the flowers and a representative from EJI. Let's say his name, Hezekiah Rankin.
we'll now have the reading of the narrative. On the evening of September 24th, 1891, Hezekiah Rankin was accused of shooting Fred A. Taylor, a white co-worker with the Western North Carolina Railroad. An altercation between the men began after Mr. Rankin was asked to perform duties unrelated to his job. During the altercation, Mr. Taylor assaulted Mr. Rankin, who allegedly left the scene and returned later with a gun. Accusations of a crime made by a white person against a black person were rarely subject to serious scrutiny. The mere suggestion of a black on white violence could spark outrage, mob violence, and murder. A group of at least 25 white residents, including the co-workers' friends, captured Mr. Rankin and lynched him by hanging him from a tree along the French Broad River just south of the Smith Bridge near the current River Art District. While three members of the mob were charged as accomplices, no individuals were charged with the lynching. Mr. Rankin, in this society, white lives held heightened value. While the lives of black people held little or none, race, rather than the alleged offense, sealed lynching victims' fates. Mr. Rankin's body was returned to his home in Elmwood, North Carolina, by train. Fox. A very special thank you to everyone that helped to make the Buncombe Community Remembrance Historical Markers Installation Program and Ceremony an unforgettable experience for everyone. This concludes our ceremony for today, but not the work of the Buncombe Remembrance Project. We will still continue to follow our established goals. Please look forward to our newsletter and postings on the MLK website for upcoming programs. Dr. Joseph Fox, thank you so much for allowing us to work with you. Uh, do we need to thank our funders and supporters this one last time? for helping to make this program possible. Uh, I will allow you to do that honor. <laughs> Once again, we want to thank the Community Foundation of Western North Carolina. We want to thank the uh, Van Winkle Law Firm. We want to thank the Dogwood Health Trust Fund. And we want to thank community leaders and residents that donated on behalf of the EJI project. We will conclude with a final prayer from Reverend uh, Brent LaPrince Edwards. As we have now come to this momentous conclusion, but the beginning of new service, can we say their names one more time? Hezekiah Rankin. John Humphreys, John Humphreys, Bob Brackett. Bob Brackett. Let us pray. Now, Lord, we dedicate this third sign in memorial as a sign to service, in memorial as a sign to the great history that has been laid by those that have come before us. Now, in the 21st century, it's our turn to serve. May we leave this place ever empowered to make that difference in the life of each human being, one heart at a time. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. And can we close by saying, reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place if you can. Reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place if you can. Reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place if you can.